Yeah, I mean, look, that's a really interesting question and it's one that's um, caught my interest right from the start of the pandemic. And and because, you know, I'm a a business school prof, I'm really interested in what happens in the workplace. And with, with social distancing and people working from home, and working, you know, in virtual teams or whatever it is. Um, and, and what I'm seeing here in Australia is that, that for, for a, a decade or more now, um, workplaces have been very reluctant to allow people not to uh, work from home. Um, but we've seen so many positives coming from it that it, it seems like that natural resistance that, that managers have to... Um, allowing people not to come into the office to work has, has finally kind of um, worn down. And so there's much more openness about, um, about doing that. And, and the, I like it for a number of reasons. And um, one is that we know that psychological outcomes in workplaces at the moment um, around the world are not very good. And, and we see anxiety, depression, mood disorders generally. Um, as as really um, high level characteristics of of workplaces and and, and, and and the toxicity that we see in in the workplace uh, these days, which comes from hyper competitiveness and uh, neoliberal economic ideology and so on. Um, and so I think in the long term, having kind of broken that that umbilical cord. Um, that sees managers and, and business leaders wanting people to be stuck forever in, in the workplace in their, um, at, at their desk um, so that they can be controlled and, and, and observed and all of that sort of stuff is finally um, perhaps going to be a thing of the past. And that's got to be a good outcome for um, people's general mental health. Um, but also... Um, it helps people, you know, you know, we all have busy lives. Um, we're, we're dealing with, with career and family and, and, and our social life and having that additional flexibility so that we're not spending, you know, let's say up to four hours a day commuting has got to be a good thing. Yeah, that's a great question. And um, I think wisdom speaks very directly to this issue with with managers and leaders. I think courage is one part of wisdom that we rarely ever talk about. And uh, so I think managers and leaders need the courage to trust people, to not be in the office all the time. And I think that's going to be hard for a lot of people. Um, All of us need some level of of empathy. so that we can support these new ways of configuring teams and relationships uh, in productive work. And of course, empathy, um, I think most of us in this space would agree is an important part of being wise. Um, and, and I guess uh, kind of a, a flip side to the, the first one about the courage to trust is uh, humility. And so we need to see managers who have the humility uh, to not want to be control freaks, to not want to surveil and watch and measure every moment of everyone's day. And and I'm going to focus here on anxiety. I think this is a big issue for us because, you know, we live in a world or we have lived in a world where we have unlimited amounts of data, unlimited amounts of information, and our capacity to create knowledge is unprecedented in human history. So we're kind of used to knowing everything. So we're used to certainty and we've become kind of lazy and inexpert at coping with ambiguity. And so I think there's um, some real questions about anxiety. And uh, John F. Kennedy uh, said in the midst of uh, the Cold War, you know, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And, um, you know, I think some of the, some of the negative behaviour we're seeing in relation to de- people dealing with uh, COVID is ultimately um, links back to, oh, hell, you know, we've got this pandemic. We don't really know how to deal with pandemics. 
um, we're afraid, we don't understand this virus, the science is not in on it yet, um, what the hell do we do? Um, we're not in control of this. Um, so there's a big, big set of questions there about um, fear of fear itself for me. This extends beyond the workplace into our daily lives. And, and if I look at some of the aberrant decision-making that, that is going on in, in uh, political leadership around the world, um, where we've seen prime ministers, presidents, who just are not grasping with the problems that are in front of us. Um, I, I see a certain level of anxiety in those people as well. And, and that, that then leads to poor decision-making or unwise decision-making, as, as you and I might think about it. Um, and I guess if we scale that up to a, a social level, I think one of the problems we're already seeing, but which I think is going to get worse as we progress, is the, the falling apart of social cohesion. And, you know, we're seeing that in, in the US in particular, um, and, and we're seeing identity politics rise and in, the whole in-group, out-group dynamic rise. There are people now who, who are, are um, sort of pigeonholing research knowledge as, um, as something that people on the left of politics believe in <laughs> and charismatic narcissism as something that conservative people believe in and um, nothing good can come from that. I mean, this is an unwise society written very brightly in the sky and, and I think it's actually very dangerous and we've seen an erosion of fundamental democratic values. I do see that as, as very serious and, you know, and the way it links to populist, um, charismatic, narcissistic leaders who, whose position in politics is really based in, in dividing people and, and you know, what, what they call in politics dog whistle um, um, politics where you inflame people's um, fear of the unknown or fear of the other, the fear of different groups in society that have different points of view. And I think it's something that we just desperately have to acknowledge and then get on with dealing with. So I think that 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 that's this is kind of a, I think where where I feel um, particularly worried um, going forward, and, and where I, I feel particularly concerned that we need we need to change the conversation and say that wisdom is not just an individual level um, uh, phenomena. It, it's also a group or a community or a society wide phenomena and. Psychological distancing, I think, is an important thing. And, and, and um, you know, I think you've, you've, you've even published on that, haven't you, Igor? And, um, but I want to go back a step further. And I, I hesitate to do this because this is a complex idea that comes to us from um, Buddhist wisdom. And it's the idea of non-judgmental um, acceptance. So in psychology terms, in therapeutic terms, we... You know, we know about acceptance-based therapy. And that comes from this very concept. And um, I think if we, to make it a little bit easier, let's go back to Al Gore's um, inconvenient truth. And he's kind of speaking to this issue with that idea of an inconvenient truth. So a pandemic is an inconvenient truth for all of us. We don't, we don't want to give up the individual freedoms um, you know, the freedom to associate and not social distance and all of that, you know, have a social life and all of that sort of stuff that we, we've just taken for granted. Um, but we, we actually don't live in that world anymore. And um, so a Buddhist wisdom perspective would say, okay, but the first step to being able to live in that world is to be able to say, well, whether I like it or not, and, and even if I want to wish this fact out of existence, I need to kind of psychologically distance myself from it and sit and just non-judgmentally process the very idea of a pandemic 
and the very ideas that that I've been talking about already about um, you know the things that we need to change psychologically in the way we approach thinking about our workplace, but also those larger community issues, the social cohesion. It's almost like there's um, a new version of middle class privilege, and we feel that 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 privilege has been threatened by having restrictions placed on us so that we don't we don't have people dying unnecessarily. You know, in the US alone, we're starting to get close to a quarter of a million deaths from COVID. Many of them, many, many, and probably most of them are actually unavoidable um, deaths. And how do we get into a situation like that? Well, one of the w- ways we get into a situation like that is by just simply not accepting that it's real, that it exists. And even if we don't like it, like climate change, many people won't like what happens in the future around climate change and the restrictions that that places on our lifestyle. But we, we, can't, we can't act in a constructive and helpful way that will actually, in the long run, improve the quality of our lives unless we can, we can be non-judgmental and accept and through that allow our thinking processes to process the meaning of what's going on um, and, and, and the salience of different measures the governments are putting, putting in place to slow down the, the, the contagiousness of, of COVID because, it, I mean, it's here forever. I mean, it's, it's not going to go away. And, and yes, maybe we'll have a vaccine that we can all get um, in 12 months time, end of 2021, um, perhaps sooner, but it still won't make the virus go away. So a lot of people will already understand that concept of um, uh, non-judgmental acceptance, which is linked to mindfulness. These are difficult skills to master, um, but they're ancient. They don't just belong to Eastern mysticism, they, you know, the same ideas proliferated in, in, in ancient Greece, in Athens. The, the Stoics and the Epicureans had almost identical ideas to, to the Buddhists. Um, but we know, we know that we can, because of, of history, we know that, that these things are doable and they're also doable at a, at a community level because the whole point of doing these things was to, to build wise communities. I would reiterate the non-judgmental acceptance idea and, and, and perhaps learning the basic mindfulness skills that underpin that. Um, but to say something new and something very quickly, it also tells me that we really need to think in interdisciplinary ways. And one of the things that if I look at it, um, all the advice that the epidemiologists are giving us about dealing with pandemics now and into the future, wouldn't it be great if people like you and me were talking to the epidemiologist and saying, okay, so when you start building these policy level responses to um, changing people's behaviour to help with the, the pandemic, what would be a wisdom approach to that? How would we, how would we deal with that? And I'm thinking... So we saw in New Zealand, after 100 days of being COVID-free, they had a breakout. And just last week here in Australia, in the city of Adelaide, they had gone 100 days COVID-free and then all of a sudden there's a breakout. So there's something going on in people and people's behaviour at around about that three to four month um, period, which is not a medical or a virus issue. It's a human behaviour and a human wisdom issue. And so wouldn't it be great um, if, if, we, if we could see that kind of interdisciplinarity come into how we respond with this new world of, of high levels of uncertainty and amb- ambiguity and, and the dangers that are attached to living in a pandemic world?